Hi everyone, this is Aidan for Fluid Mechanics 101 and today I'm going to be talking to you about how fine should my CFD mesh be. So just to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to start by looking at how small should Y plus be for us to obtain an accurate CFD solution. I'm then going to move on to look at how small should my cells be to ensure that I achieve that target Y plus in my CFD solution. And then to finish, I'm going to look at a simple technique we can use to get a good initial guess for how large our cells should be when we're constructing our mesh. So to start with some background, as I've discussed in previous videos, the wall adjacent cell uses special modeling techniques to ensure that the wall shear stress and the boundary layer profile is computed correctly. And the way modern CFD codes do this is they adopt a model for how the velocity profile behaves between the cell centroid and the wall. And what we can see from the diagram there that I've put on the screen, most of you will be familiar with this plot by now, is the black line shows experimental measurements for how the velocity profile varies when we're close to the wall. And the blue and the green lines show the two models that modern CFD codes use to capture this behavior in the wall adjacent cell. And with this behavior, what one normally does is either targets a Y plus value of less than five. And as you can see from the diagram, if our Y plus value is less than five, then the black curve, which is the experimental measurements, follows the blue, the blue curve, which is used by the CFD solver very closely for less than five. On the other hand, if we target a Y plus value between 30 and 200, then we place our cell in the log law region and we're on the right portion of the curve there and the CFD code uses the green curve to model the observed behavior there shown in black. So what we're doing when we're constructing our mesh and trying to achieve our solution is we're either going to place our Y plus value in the viscous sublayer, less than five, or in the log law region between 30 and 200. And the reason we do this is to ensure that the solution that we achieve is accurate. We may still be able to achieve a converged solution if our Y plus value lies outside this range. However, we want to ensure that the solution we compute is accurate and follows real life. And to do that, we place some stringent restrictions on the Y plus value that we target when we go for our CFD solution. Now, just a reminder of what Y plus is and how it's defined. Y plus is given there in equation one, and Y plus is the dimensionless distance of the cell centroid from the nearest wall, YP. So YP is the distance you can see there in the diagram from the wall to the cell centroid. Rho is the fluid density in the cell. Mu is the kinematic viscosity and u tau is a friction velocity which is given by the square root of the wall shear stress and this is a this is a measure of the effective velocity in that cell now from the previous slide we remember that we're going to be targeting a value of y plus and if we're going for a viscous sublayer resolved treatment then we want our y plus to be less than five on the other hand if we're going for a log law model then we want our Y plus to be between 30 and 200. Now, as many of you are aware, before we start our CFD simulation, we don't know what our Y plus is and we'd like to target it. And if we'd like to target a value of Y plus, then we need to know how large to make our cells. What value of YP should we be using when we construct our mesh? And what this will look like when you use your mesh generator is this will either be the height of the first cell in an inflation layer off the wall or the height of the first cell if we're using some kind of block structured grid and as the, the user of CFD we'd like to know how big should that cell be. Now the problem is even if we want a y plus of 5 say we can rearrange that formula in equation 1 to work out what value of yp we should be using when we construct our mesh. However we don't know what the wall shear stress is yet because we haven't computed our CFD solution. So what you can really see from just this simple explanation here is that 
in order to know what value of YP to use, we have to already have a CFD solution. And that creates a bit of a problem for us because we don't know what value of YP we should be using. And one approach would be to use a value that we've used from a previous simulation, for example, if we've used similar applications and we always find that a YP value of 10 to the minus five always seems to work, then we could use that as our initial guess. But what if we're approaching a new problem and we're constructing a new mesh for a new geometry at a new Reynolds number and we don't know what value to use for YP? And that's what I'm gonna talk about today in this set of slides. I'm gonna give you a simple method that you can use to decide how large you should make your cells for that initial guess before you've run your CFD simulation. And the way that we do this is overall, we model the wall as a flat plate boundary layer. And the reason that we model the wall as a flat plate boundary layer is that empirical data is available for this very simple flow scenario. And with this model, we can use the empirical results to work out what the wall shear stress will be and then back out a value of YP that we can use for the initial guess when we're making our mesh. Don't worry if that sounds complicated because what I'm gonna do now is run through the process step by step so that you can see exactly how you can make that good initial guess when you're constructing your mesh. So the first thing to do for your flow scenario, whatever that may be, is to calculate the Reynolds number for your flow. And the Reynolds number will be given by your fluid density multiplied by the free stream velocity or the characteristic velocity for that flow multiplied by some characteristic length scale divided by the dynamic viscosity of the fluid. Now if we were modeling a real flat plate L here would be the length of the flat plate or the distance from the leading edge but as we're using this tool to estimate what the wall shear stress is going to be for our case for L, the characteristic length, we'd take some characteristic length of our geometry that we're trying to model. So if this was an aerofoil or a wing, for example, we might take the chord length or the length of that aerofoil section for our characteristic length scale. And if we had a more complex geometry, we might try and estimate the effective length of that geometry and use that for our characteristic length scale. And once we've, once we've calculated a Reynolds number, what we can do is use an empirical result to calculate approximately what the skin friction coefficient is going to be. And here we've used the result for a flat plate boundary layer so that the skin friction coefficient is given there by equation three. Now, a few of you may notice, and if you look up in textbooks, you'll of course find many different formulas that you can use to compute the skin friction coefficient for a flat plate boundary layer. However, one needs to take care when choosing the formulas here, as we need to ensure that the formula we choose is for a fully turbulent boundary layer on a flat plate. And the reason we do this is if we're using a RANS turbulence model that doesn't have any model for transitional behavior, the model itself assumes that the flow is fully turbulent. So as we're trying to get an estimate for our CFD model, we take an empirical formula that assumes the flat plate boundary layer is fully turbulent. And that equation there, which I gave on the previous slide, uh, is the formula by Schlichting. And this formula is appropriate for flat plate boundary layers, which is the reason for choosing this. And what the formula does is it essentially follows the behavior that you can see there in the plot, where the skin friction coefficient generally uh, decreases with increasing Reynolds number following that trend. And we always want to ensure that we choose a formula that follows the fully turbulent boundary layer. And you could use any number or of formulas or any formula of your choice, but of course always remember that this is just an estimate for how small our first guess for our mesh should be. And ultimately we're going to update this guess anyway. So it doesn't ultimately matter which formula you choose to use for skin friction coefficient. I'm just using the previous formula because uh, it's very simple and very straightforward to use. So now that we have an estimate for our skin friction coefficient, we can calculate the wall shear stress for our geometry. And to do that, we of course uh, multiply the skin friction coefficient there by a half rho u squared to give us the wall shear stress. And now that we've got the wall shear stress, we can take the square root of that and divide by density 
and that gives us the friction velocity that we were missing from our y plus formula that we saw earlier. So now what we can do is rearrange our expression for y plus in terms of yp and you can see that there in equation 6. That yp is given by y plus, that's the y plus that we're targeting, maybe less than 5 or it may be between 30 and 200, multiplied by the dynamic viscosity and divided by the product of the density and that uh, friction velocity that we just estimated there in the previous slide. And this will give us an estimate for how far our wall adjacent cell, cell centroid YP there should be from the wall for our first guess. And before carrying on, I want to just uh, point out uh, for a few of you that when we use this method, what we're doing is we're calculating the distance of the cell centroid from the wall. That's YP there, you can see in the diagram. However, we should take care when constructing our mesh because often the parameter that we set is the height of the entire cell. So that's YH you can see there in the diagram. So you should always remember that once you've calculated YP, if you go back into your mesh generator, and you're setting an inflation layer parameter or the number of nodes along the side of a block, then you should take care to ensure that you use YH and not YP. Otherwise, uh, your value will be out by a factor of two, which won't be very useful to you. So let's just quickly run through the overall process here. What we do is we construct an initial mesh in our mesh generator and we use the set of uh, previous formulas that I went through there to estimate an initial value for YP, the distance of the cell centroid from the wall. And then what we do is we run an initial CFD solution. And once we run our CFD solution and have a converged solution, we extract the variation and the value of Y plus from the CFD results using a post-processor. And now this gives us our value of Y plus, and what we can do there is then refine our mesh again. So if Y plus is too large, we go back to our mesh and reduce that cell height because we know that currently our Y plus is too large. Once we've done that, we rerun the simulation and we keep repeating this iterative process until we achieve the target value of Y plus that we want. And just to give you an, uh, an example of how that might work, you can see there in the table that for our initial CFD simulation, using our empirical formulas, we may come up with a value of 10 to the minus five for YP. And we run the CFD simulation and we find that Y plus is 2.5. So then we think if we wanted our Y plus value to be less than one, for example, we might then decide we're going to make our cells smaller by a factor of 2.5 so that our y plus value will be less than 1. We update the mesh, rerun the simulation and we find that y plus is now 1.2 for example. We then repeat the process until we find that we have a value of y plus that we're happy with and that is generally the process that we use for choosing the uh, resolution of our wall adjacent cell. Now of course, it's also worth noticing that a value of Y plus does not indicate a fully converged solution. And while we're refining our mesh and looking at other parameters, we should also check that the simulation is converged in terms of residuals, uh, point monitors in the flow field, and integrated forces and moments on our surfaces. So for example, for our aerofoil, we would like to ensure that the lift and drag coefficient are also converged and independent of mesh, res mesh resolution. And this will tend to occur as we reduce Y plus and we refine in the wall normal direction. Now some further points to think about when refining our mesh is that Y plus of course isn't a single value and Y plus actually varies over the entire surface of the wall. And what I've got for you there in the diagram is just a little example of a 2D aerofoil simulation which you might have and then some a plot on the left there for the variation of Y plus along the length of the cord of the aerofoil. And you can see there that we start with our initial mesh, which is shown in red, and Y plus varies over the entire surface, and near the leading edge it's actually up to about 7, when it drops off towards the trailing edge to a value of around about 1. And so as we refine the mesh, then Y plus changes and reduces everywhere over the entire surface. And this can be quite confusing to analyze, but 
one thing we should always remember is that what we're trying to do is prioritize a value of y plus in the areas we care about. So for an aerofoil, for example, the area that we care about most is the trailing edge on the suction surface, as this is where flow separation is most likely to initiate, and this has the strongest effect on the lift and drag coefficients of the aerofoil. So mostly for an aerofoil example, we'd be looking and focusing on the Y plus value on that suction surface there. That would be our priority. And what we do is continually refine the mesh and then look at lift and drag until we have a sufficiently, a sufficiently converged solution that also runs in a realistic length of time. Because of course, as we reduce the value of uh, YP and Y plus on the surface, then the aspect ratio of our cells is also going to increase. And we're also going to be increasing the cell count or the total number of cells. So our simulation is going to slow down as we refine. So ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to converge to an efficient solution that's sufficiently accurate in terms of Y plus, also runs in a reasonable length of time and this is where the main engineering judgment comes in you have to look carefully at the numbers and, and your results when you do it of course we may also want to consider refining in the other directions so along the span for example however as we know from boundary layer theory the gradients in our boundary layer are steepest normal to the wall in most cases and that's why we prioritize refining in the wall normal direction before we prioritize refining in the spanwise direction. But spanwise resolution is also something you should consider as a separate investigation uh, in your CFD simulations. Now to finish off, I'd just like to introduce you here for a quick, simple and easy to use calculator that you can use for estimating the first cell height in your CFD simulations. And I've got this quick calculator already set up for you on my website so it's quick and easy to use. And all you need to do is navigate to my website, which is www.fluidmechanics101.com. There'll be a link in the description below, so it's easy to find. And then all you wanna do is navigate to the top and just click on the useful tools icon. And then what you'll find here straight away is a first cell height calculator. And what this first cell height calculator will do for your CFD simulation if you know the velocity, so say we have a velocity of 10 meters per second, our length scale of our geometry is one meter, and the fluid is air, so we know its dynamic viscosity, and we know its density, and we give a target Y plus value, so say this was an aerofoil and we wanted a Y plus value of one, and then we hit calculate, and this calculator will run the sequence of calculations that you saw there in this slide, and as you can see, it kicks out the Reynolds number and a value for the first cell height from the wall, YP there. So you could use that 3.3, 10 to the minus five in your uh, mesh generator to quickly knock up your first mesh. So that's a nice, simple, easy to use calculator, which you can use and just refer back to at any time you want uh, on my website. And of course, underneath, I've also provided all the equations for how the calculator works as well. So perhaps you don't want to use the calculator, but you'd like to use those equations yourself in, uh, in some other document, then the equations are all here explaining how the calculator works as a reminder. Um, and also while you're on my website, you might also like to check out some of the other features. Uh, I've got links to all of the other videos which you've seen on my channel. Uh, for example, here in the wall functions section, the velocity wall functions video, got a link to the video and underneath I've what I've done is I've carefully constructed some summary notes for uh, all of the slides and the discussion which you've seen in the YouTube video and all of the equations are there conveniently laid out for you so perhaps if you're in a situation where you need to quickly rush in and find an equation that you've seen in one of my slides but you don't want to scroll through the YouTube video to find where exactly that equation was or perhaps you're in a scenario where you're in a, a, a lecture or a meeting and you can't actually access videos for whatever reason, then you can just jump on my website and the equations are all there with a coherent explanation. And of course, references are all there at the bottom as well if you need to provide references. So just to wrap up, uh, a few useful references for you. 
Uh, if, you, if you're actually looking for the origin of that Schlichting formula, then the book is there, which you can find the empirical relationship for. Or if perhaps you'd like to look at some other empirical relationships uh, for skin friction coefficient of a flat plate, then generally any uh, core fundamental fluid mechanics textbook has all of those formulas in. So for example, I put the uh, Chengel and Simbala textbook, which I've used in the past, which has all of the formulas in there, but you can really use whatever you want. And that just about wraps up this video. Uh, thank you guys again for watching and supporting the channel. I really do appreciate it. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for future videos, uh, just leave them in the comment section below. Uh, I do try to get to all the comments and address them uh, as soon as possible. And it also really helps uh, support and grow the channel. And please do head over to my website and uh, see what you think. I hope you'll find lots of useful material there. Uh, thanks again for watching. Until next time.